and welcome to the It's Record Time podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and this is the show where each week I'm joined by a different guest to talk about their favourite albums, biggest influences, and the bands that they love. This week I was joined by English folk and punk singer Frank Turner. I was absolutely over the moon to have Frank on the show. I've been a fan of his for a super long time, going all the way back to when he was singing A Million Dead, like 15 years ago, however long ago that was. So getting to have a chat with him was an absolute trip for me. On top of that, he was an absolutely great guest. He was really friendly, really engaged, very knowledgeable, very funny, and made some brilliant recommendations for some albums I think you're all going to really enjoy. In amongst the albums, we talked about a range of different things, including Frank joining TikTok, playing Games Workshop as a kid, and the eroticism of Nick Cave. We also touched on the No Effect split Frank released last year, as well as a bit of chat around his old albums as well. I'll be back at the end for a bit more chat, but until then, enjoy it! How are you? Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> always at the moment with the caveat that we're living in the middle of a fucking pandemic. Um, I'm all right. You know, could be worse. Um, uh, I moved house in the last year, kind of a bit of a change of pace um, out to the coast, um, and I'm loving it. And I've built myself a recording studio in which I'm currently sat. Um, and yeah, you know, life could be worse. So obviously, over like the last 15 years, you've averaged something like 160 shows a year, and you've spent the last 12 months in like one place. How have you coped with that? Is cope um, even the right word? Uh, cope is the right word. I mean, it, you know, it, the beginning of lockdown was really tough uh, on a lot of levels. I mean, um, I've always been the guy who's on tour, and I predictably was on tour when lockdown kicked in and so immediately it just sucked because we had to curtail a tour that i was on that was it was sold out and it was loads of fun i was on tour with my wife and one of my best friends and you know we were just having a blast um and so that sucked um and it sucks financially obviously that's usually how i make my living is touring um but i think more than those things it was an identity thing for me i don't want to be too mm. highfalutin about this but that's who I am. I'm the guy who tours, you know, and like suddenly it's like, well, you can't do that now. You've got to stay at home. And something as simple as just the fact that I woke, I've been waking up in the same bed every day for how long has been really, really odd for me. Um, and certainly, I mean, I kind of found my level with it after a while, but there was definitely a period of time um, in the kind of spring and summer of last year where I really struggled with that. The other thing um, was you know, contrary to popular belief, touring is not some endless chaotic stag do. Um, it's actually quite a structured way of living. And I and that's something that I personally find quite useful. You know, my, I, I know what I'm doing all day. I know what I'm doing in a week's time and all the rest of it. And it means I can be more kind of focused and productive in my life. And the unstructured parts of my life are those usually a day or two maybe three when you get back from tour and you just go Bleh, on your sofa and watch Netflix in your pants. And I kind of did that for like the first month of lockdown and it's a shit way to live for a month and um, <laughs> it's unhealthy and it's unproductive and all the rest of it. And so I guess one of my major coping mechanisms has been trying to build structure and routine into a non-tour life, which was an interesting <laughs> project i mean there were definitely days when i considered calling my tour manager and seeing if i could just hire her to tell me to do shit um <laughs> given moments of the day she told me to go fuck myself so that wasn't an option but um yeah you know it, it's definitely been a learning curve um and it's funny because a lot there's a oh, there is a cliche about being in a touring man's like an extended adolescence and there's some truth to that and if there are parts of me that feel like i've kind of had to grow up quite a lot in the last um in the last year uh which is a strange thing to say but it's true has the extended break do you think the extended break will sort of influence the way that you tour in the future or are you sort of like no i'm going to get back out to um, the same continuous level i was i think that it's certainly going to make me never ever take it for granted again that's certainly true. Um, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, me and my band, my touring family, let's say, have kind of, we've eased off the gas a little bit because, you know, people have got kids, people have got married, people have sat down a little bit more. Um, and I'm not saying that we're going to now abandon that and go straight back to how we used to tour in like 2013 because Jesus Christ. Um, but, um, you know, I certainly think that like, I mean, if, if for no other reason than financial, like as soon as it's possible to tour again, I'm going to be do a fair amount of touring straight away simply because like help essentially <laughs> um, uh but you know uh so there's that i mean i i don't know i mean i think that 
the effects of what we're currently living through will be long lasting in many ways across society. And I think that might well be true within the context of an industry that revolves around gathering people together in confined spaces, whether that's to do with people's comfort, um, some people not wanting to come to gigs anymore, that I think that might well be a thing. Um, I, do, I, I don't really know what it will mean. Uh, you know, maybe streaming will continue to be a part of things. I mean, I'm, I tend to be skeptical about that, but who knows? Um, but yeah, so there's definitely, I, th I think there will be changes to it. But um, on the flip side, I think that for me and for a lot of people, there's this like um, ravenous hunger for <laughs> live entertainment right now. Um, or at least I'm, I fucking hope there is. <laughs> um, so uh, fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, I'll be out on the road soon. You're not going to pack it all in and become full time TikTok star then? No, I don't really understand TikTok. I've kind of got an account. It's funny you should mention that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've kind of started doing bits and bobs on it, but it's entirely opaque to me what the point is. But um, my record label were very keen for me to get a TikTok account. So now I've got one. I was very sadly scrolling through it the other day and you popped up on it. And I was quite shocked to see you on there. Um, and then you I just was doing... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I tend to just sort of, it's the perfect way to waste an hour of your life and not realize you've done it. Like it's an absolute yeah. time sink. It's really, it's a really bizarre thing. Yeah. Well, this is the thing I've kind of, I started by looking at other people's stuff to like get some ideas and then I'm not going to do a video of me appearing in my underwear halfway through. And I don't really do dancing in public. Um, and I don't really have any DIY tips, and I seem to be a little bit kind of lost on that front. Um, I don't know. I'll find my, my metier at some point, I'm sure. So obviously you haven't just been on TikTok over lockdown as well. <laughs> You've been doing all of your streams for uh, the independent venues raising money um, mm. for, is it about 21 different venues now? It was exactly 21 different venues, yes. Uh, I also did some other ones for like my band and crew, one for my record label. Um, I did one for my studio, actually, because... I figured I was allowed one for myself. Um, uh, but um, yeah, it's, they've been fundraisers, basically. Yeah, and you've raised, what, a quarter of a million pound doing them, which is unbelievable. Yeah, that's, that's the venue count. And it's it's it's, it's that's an estimate because um, yeah. I tend to stop counting a, a, a day or two afterwards, stop counting, stop paying attention to the ticket because I feel like my work here is done and I, I fade into the background. Um, uh, but, you know, I feel pretty good about that. I mean, I you know, I haven't. I haven't donated a quarter of a million pounds because I don't fucking have a quarter of a million quid. Um, but uh, I have um, facilitated that amount of money getting raised and thrown in what I can when I can afford it and all the rest of it. And it feels like uh, it's 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 something from the last year I can look back on with a degree of pride. So you're you're pausing those shows for a while, or potentially indefinitely, yeah, I mean, if you're able to actually get back. Yeah, I, I paused them once before. I paused them last mm. summer when things started kind of loosening up over here. Um, and uh, it's also, it's just like there is, it, there is a certain fatigue that kicks in after a while, both in terms of me picking a set list. Uh, I think there's just a limited number of times anybody wants to see just me with my guitar banging on for an hour and a half, and including myself. Um, but also, you know, in terms of audience numbers and donation amounts and all that kind of thing, do you know what I mean? There's, it's, it's not indefinite. As, as a methodology and I, particularly this time around I want to go out on a high rather than letting it just kind of peter out so we did a last one and we actually got the, a massive total for that one we did about 12 and a half grand for that one which is awesome um, but do you know what I mean I, I, I'd rather kind of like leave with a yeah. flourish <laughs> um, so you also back in July you were the first socially distant show to take place in the UK for a few months, weren't you? Uh, yeah. At the Clapham Crown. Indoors, yeah. yeah. Indoors, yeah. Um, yeah. And I was reading your blog post about that earlier today, and you talked about, briefly mentioned a conversation you had with Jay from Beans on Toast around the emotion of being on stage for the first time and how that hit you and being back in a venue and in sort of a changing room and all the rest of it. For anyone who's listening who's a performer or anyone who's just waiting to get back to shows can you give like an idea of what being back on stage is going to feel like after all of this is done whether it's in three months or a year yeah i mean the thing is like in life anything it doesn't matter how remarkable it is anything that you do over and over again is going to accrue a certain degree of like routine to it do you know what i mean yeah. um i'm sure that Paul McCartney gets pretty bored of playing Hey Dude sooner or later do you know what i mean it's, it's just unavoidable it's the nature of human ex existence but um so but to have that taken away like and not by choice and then be able to go back to it um 
was really quite something. Also, having done for myself, having done a lot of the live streaming thing, one of the things that's weird about that, and that I obviously got used to over time, but it's like you finish a song and essentially nothing happens. Um, I mean, my wife applauds, um, which is lovely, <laughs> and my cat looks disdainful, but she always does that. Um, and but you know, it's it's and after uh, right at the beginning of the live streams, it made me realize quite how much the energy exchange between stage and audience is important to the show. And then as time went on, I sort of, you know, I don't want to say I forgot about it per se, but I just got used again to the current format of things. And it was just that thing of finishing a song and getting this blast of like energy coming out of the room was indescribable. It was amazing. And it's and it was so much better than like, you know, your first gig or whatever, because at your first gig, you're terrified and you've got nobody to do what you're doing and you probably sucked. Um, and nobody knew who you were and nobody sung along and no one cared. Um, you know, whereas in this instance, it was just like, it was kind of like the best first gig ever sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, um, if you were somehow instantly famous and, and everyone knew your songs or whatever, it, it was it was emotional. I'll say that. Um, and I think it was emotional for everyone in the room as well, um, if I may be so bold. Um, it, it definitely it, it was uh, tangibly exciting. Okay, we're going to go. We're going to talk about some of the people's music, uh, not yours so, anymore. Is, I'm afraid, Frank. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first category I'm going to go for is the first album you ever purchased. Can you remember what it was and where you got <clears throat> it and when you got it? Yes, I can. The first album that I purchased, as in with my money, I mean, with this is when I was about 10 years old, so it's pocket money, so you can argue the toss on that, but um, uh, was actually Number of the Beast by Iron Maiden. Um, the first album I ever got was Killers by Iron Maiden, which my dad got me. Um, my parents don't believe in, in modern music, rock and roll, certainly not heavy metal, but I'd sort of, I'd stumble across the music of Iron Maiden, expressed an interest, and my dad picked up a cassette copy of Killers from the R Price at Waterloo Station, if you can imagine a world in which there was a record shop at a station anymore. But anyway, um, and he brought it home and he gave it to me, um, and I lost my shit um and my parents were extremely disappointed in this I don't, i'm not sure <laughs> I my dad still regards it as his, his central parenting error in life was buying that cassette because it changed everything for me it was like a light switch going on and then you know i listened to it to death and then i think i kind of it, it took me like a, a couple of weeks to triangulate that there was more than one iron maiden album that existed <laughs> and i was like oh my god there are other ones like this so i went out and i got um uh, uh, Number of the Beast was the second one I got. It, I can't remember this specifically, but it must have been from the R Price in Winchester um, because that's where we were. Um, and yeah, I remember loving it. So many people, when I ask them that question, they come back with something terrible. Um, for reference, <laughs> um, Beans on Toast was on here a couple of weeks ago, and his was Do the Bartman by The Simpsons. Yes. Uh, and he <laughs> said then, if anyone says that their first album is something cool, they're lying. Um, but I think you're the exception that's just proved this, proven this rule. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is a great album. It is a great. It is. I mean, it, it's an arguably still my favourite main record, funnily enough. But um, I mean, I know exactly what Jay's talking about. Um, I had an I had a long argument with some people a few years ago, which was utterly pointless. But it, I just got you got into trouble with certain denizens of the underground scenes to punk rock internet presence because I made the point that nobody gets into Black Flag or you know catharsis or any whatever underground band you want to cite just by randomly buying one of their records every day everybody gets into them via green day or offspring or blink 182 or whoever it might be and that therefore gateway punk bands are an entirely reputable thing in life like you know good for them well done and, and i fucking love green day and blink 182 and offspring i don't care um anyway uh so but but yeah i mean it was my my, my stumbling across i made was completely random i was playing um games workshop Yes, that, yes, it's true. Um, with with a with a friend of mine, his older brother had an Iron Maiden poster on the bedroom wall, and I thought it was something to do with Games Workshop. It looked like it was sort of in the same universe, and and said to my mate, "Oh, that's cool." And he said, "Oh, it's a band." And I said, "Get out of here! There's no band that that's that cool. How could a band be that cool?" I didn't really know any bands at that point in my life. I think I've heard Sergeant Pepper by the Beatles in the car, and that was about it. Um, uh, and then, you know, made this kind of ra random hail mary across to my dad. So, you know, there were reasons for it. And the, the other moment in my own personal musical journey, which was, um, I so I went out and sort of gradually bought all the Maiden records that were out at the time on cassette. This was up to and including No Prayer for the Dying for those of you who want to be nerdy about this. Um, and then uh, I. Um, uh, 
I remember it was like a it was like a Christmas family gathering, and a distant cousin of mine, who's ten years older than me, was cracked up by the fact that I was this ten year old who was like number of the beats, um, and he sort of was like, you know, there are other bands like this as well, and I was like, no, <laughs> what, what are you talking about? And he then gave me, he made me a tape that had ACDC Thunderstruck on one side and uh, Judas Priest Painkiller on the other side. Uh, oh, nice. and gave me that and that was almost as big an explosion in my mind because it was like <gasps> there are other bands um you know and then and then i got into metallica and and megadeth and slayer and pantera and everything else but um yeah it was that that moment of realizing it wasn't it, i made me this kind of completely like isolated event so presumably you started so you so you were about 10 so this is early 90s yeah this is sort of 92 ish so Presumably, you must have start. You started playing guitar not that long after this. Was it when you first started playing? Was it playing this sort of thrash metal stuff? Yeah, badly, yes. Um, I mean, the very first thing that happened. I think it. I think it was my eleventh birthday. I got the Argos starter kit. You know, where you get a black and white stack copy, which, funnily enough, is over there currently, um, uh, and like a thirty watt amp, and it comes with a strap and a lead uh, and all this sort of business. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, cost like 80 quid or something. And my parents got it for me. Actually, my birthday's right next to Christmas. And I figured out around that age that I could tr combine birthday and Christmas presents in order to up my sort of potential spend, <laughs> as it were. So yeah, I got that for Christmas. And I, I don't know, It's a, I guess it's just a facet of my personality. I'm quite participatory. I'd heard this thing that I loved and it was like, cool, how do I do that? How do I get involved in doing that? Um, and I got... Um, I remember actually when I got I got Burt Whedon's play in a day, which was useful. Um, and I also got like the tab to Seventh Son of the Seventh Son or something, which was a fucking mystery to me. And and kind of still is because I'm nowhere near good enough to play any fucking maiden songs. <laughs> um but you know that was yeah, I, and and like actually that was that was a big part of where ACDC figured in my life is that ACDC riffs were kind of comparatively easy to play, uh, and that was quite useful to me as a kid. And actually, then my other massive, huge signpost moment at that point in my life, and it was actually probably only about two years later, but obviously when you're a kid, it feels like a lifetime. Was Nirvana? Um, you know, I figured out that Kerrang was a thing because I made more on the cover one time, so I stopped buying Kerrang magazine. Actually, funnily enough, my parents banned me from buying Kerrang magazine because the first one I ever bought had a f feature on Cannibal Corpse in it, and they were just like, <laughs> no. Um, so I used to have to like shoplift it or sneak off and buy it or whatever. Um, but uh, Nirvana were in Kerrang quite a lot at this period of time, so night three, night four, and um. And I got bang into Nirvana, as, as, as you might do. And again, part of the reason for that, because by this point, I was sort of playing in a bedroom band with two of my best friends, um, was that, you know, we couldn't fucking play anything off Justice for All. Jesus Christ. Still, again, still can't. Whereas, you know, I remember when Inutero came out, we got it and we we had a, a crap version of Heart Shaped Box together, you know, a couple of weeks later. Um, and I'm not saying it was any good, but we could at least sort of slaughter our way through it. And and that was quite um, vivid. Do you know what I mean? Almost yeah. in a way, it's, that's a kind of punk rock moment, that moment when it's like, I can do this too. So presumably they're more of the, I guess, more like skate punk stuff, which came out around night four, night five, night six. You gradually moved into that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, so then the next part of the story was that Kurt Cobain used to refer to himself as a punk quite often. Um, in interviews um, and also instantly when he then died I took that as a personal affront because I, I was a recent fan and it was like well, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what I mean I was, I, was like, I was planning on seeing you live um, uh, but um, I didn't mean don't mean to be disrespectful to the day he was a genius um, uh, but um, uh, he'd use the word punk and like my the two guys I was in band with our drummer's uncle knew about music and he was pretty much the only person we knew who knew about music. So I remember we said to him, what's punk? Uh, Uncle Simon or whatever. And he laughed. And he told us to go and get Nevermind the Bollocks and the first Clash record, which we did. Um, and those were both pretty kind of life-changing records. Um, incidentally, I love the Clash, but I'm definitely on Team Pestles for, as far as those first two go. Jesus fucking Christ. Nevermind the Bollocks is one of the most viscerally brilliant records ever made. Anyway, um, uh, so, uh, you know, um, uh, and kind of got into that kind of stuff. And then that then chimed with sort of just at that moment in time, Green Day sort of arrived. And like people I knew who hadn't been part of this little band that I was doing with my mates were suddenly into Green Day, who were a punk band. And it was like, 
what? Um, you know, and then well, I suppose I'd better be into that too. And I remember, you know, went out and got Ricky and, and, and got um, smashed. Both incredible records. Um, and then I don't know about you, I sort of feel like, I think this is probably true of any given sort of fad or explosion or however you want to put it in music. But like for every 10 kids I knew who got into Green Day and Offspring, three would have a no effects record maybe do you know yeah. what i mean and then of those yeah, three one would get a black flag record so there was a filtration yeah. process and i don't mean to kind of try to accrue any sort of like personal value in saying that but it just seemed to be how it worked you know and i got into that world of do you know what i mean but we used to triangulate thanks lists me no. and my mates so what you do you'd have a copy of, you'd, you'd have like let's say you get three punk records so you've got like smash Ducky and um, uh, Punk and Drug Lake or something, or you know, and then all those bands always used to endlessly thank bands in their thanks lists. So you'd sit down, you'd look through, and if there was one band that appeared on all three thanks lists, it was like, right, we've got to fucking get into them next. <laughs> so then you add them to the pile, and then you'd do it again, and that was a way because this is pre the internet, and there were no magazines. I mean, Kerrang would write about the top end of that scene, but no one wrote about you know, Dag Nasty or <laughs> any of that kind of shit. Do you know what I mean? So, and for the most part, that was a really cool way of getting into music because it was quite sort of, you were kind of going in blind a lot of the time. And a lot of these records we had to order from the record store. Um, actually, the guy who worked at the record store in uh, the R Price in Winchester got to the point where he put aside anything that was on Epitaph for me and my mates, which was pretty cool. Do you know what I mean? Um, and... Again, nine times out of ten, that'd be fucking great. I mean, it did also mean that there were some ugh, moments as well <laughs> here and there. Um, but, you know, and then there were the samplers, Fat Rack, and, uh, and the Fat Music Fat People, and then all the Epitaph, Punkarama samplers, and all that kind of shit. So, you know, there were, there were ways of kind of getting into stuff, but it was, a, it was a more sort of gradualist process, I think, back then than it is now. So like, out of those bands you've just mentioned, especially on the punk side, there's No Effects are in there, Offspring in there, Green Day are in there. You've played with or in some way I presume no pretty much all of those bands that you've yeah. just name checked yeah that, you... that, is true. that was not delivered I should add, but no. yeah. <laughs> no, this, this is the problem of you just being the most prol prolific tourer in the world frank you've just ended up playing with everyone but um do you ever get over that fact of being like shit this is the stuff i listened to in my bedroom as a kid and now like i've just released a split with no facts like <laughs> well i mean the short answer is fuck no um the no effects split is a is a specific case which we'll come to in a minute but yeah you know i i toured with social d and like white light white heat white trash is one of my absolute fucking favorite records when i was a kid and one of the really i think almost one of the first records i bought when i went beyond green day and offspring do you know what i mean um and uh you know we toured with them back in 2010 and funnily enough actually nobody in my band knew who they were and i was like you guys are fucking idiots <laughs> um and uh and uh, I was extremely stoked about that. I toured with the Offspring in 2009 at their request. I mean, fucking hell, what do you say about things like that? And, it, and I suppose what I should probably do is not say very much, but I certainly don't want to come across like I'm not stoked by it. Do you know what I mean? It's fucking amazing. Yeah, yeah. And it will always be amazing to me. I hope I never lose a sense of wonder about that because that strikes me as a shitty kind of personality direction <laughs> to go in. Um, the no effects thing in particular is crazy. I mean, I've been friends with Mike for a over a decade um uh we met at reading festival one year i ended up playing guitar with them that day funnily enough um matt skiba was supposed to play guitar on the end of the decline and he'd done a runner and um there was a panic backstage and someone was like who knows how to play it and i was like i do um and uh, <laughs> we had mutual friends or whatever and it got sorted out um but then uh you know and mike has always sort of said he was a fan of my stuff but that's what you say to your friend who's a musician do you know what I mean? You don't kind of go, yeah, I love you as a person. Your music's rubbish. Um, so, um, but so I'd always taken it slightly with a pinch of salt. And then summer 2019, he turned around and uh, we were at a festival together in Italy, both playing. And he just said, do you want to do a mutual cover split? And I was like, yes. I mean, like, you know, pushing, pushing down the kind of the euphoria a little bit to remain externally cool. Um, but I mean, I think, you know, if I had to pick a list of things that I've done in my career that I would a top three or whatever of things that I, I consider the most impressive. That was definitely on that list, unquestionably. Fuck me. I did a split with no effect. And certainly it, it wins every stupid fucking internet argument about punk. <laughs> Just pull out the fat mic card every time you're great. It's like a blue tick in the punk world doing a split with no effect. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> 
Uh, okay, the next category we're going to go for is favorite live album. Are you a big live album listener? Is there any that you sort of come back to a lot? Um, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I'm I tend towards cynicism about live records for the simple reason that I think that live performance and recorded music are two separate kind of endeavors. And I mean, a big part of a show is the uh, the the ephemeral atmosphere in the room you're there and it's one night and it happens and if you weren't there then go fuck yourself and go to another show on the tour whatever i mean obviously when you talk about older acts or, or acts that predate me or whatever that changes a little bit um and then of course you know there are some absolute humdingers i mean two of my favorite records ever actually are um, live at the old quarter by towns van zandt um which is a it's a recording of towns playing to about 30 people in a bar in 1972 and like very audibly at the beginning, not that many people give a fuck. Um, and uh, by the end of it, it's pin drop quiet. And he's just, I mean, he, he's one of my all time favorite songwriters. I have his initials tattooed on my wrist. Um, and it's, you know, if you're not familiar with the work of Towns Van Zandt, I would heartily recommend starting with that live record because it's just a fucking masterclass. One man with a guitar um, telling the truth however you want to put it um so that's a, a big one the other my other favorite live record is one night stand at harlem square by sam cook obviously you know there's no way i could have ever seen sam cook play he died in the 1960s um but uh also just like there's something the, the, i don't know if you know the backstory to that record it's it's phenomenal um he was coming up in the world of being a kind of you know a sort of motown ish kind of pop soul crooner sort of thing and he did what everybody does which is do a live record from the copacabana and it was a complete disaster because you have to use the house band at the Copa and it's very sort of stage. Generally speaking, even possibly at that point in time, it was white only audience and black performers on stage, which is fucked. And and just so he did a live record from Coca Banner and it was terrible. Um, and he was furious because he sort of said to people, this isn't what I want to do. And then it flopped. And then he took his own money and put it into recording himself playing at a black club, the, the Harlem Square Club in New York with his band playing the way that he did a show. And it's it's it has what every live record wants and not many of them have, which is it's so it's just electrifying. And I love it. The sonics of it. This is an anachronistic word to use, but they're kind of punk, you know, like the fucking kick and snare sound are just like blown out. And um, he is just absolutely stunning as a performer. Um, he's just all over the place, uh, and yeah, it's it's a it's a very very exciting record, and um, yeah, I've spent quite a lot of the last few years obsessed with that album actually. So you said there's sort of this you 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 have that that relationship with live albums that's slightly different than the live albums you've put out. What then made you go? Oh, I'm going to do that. You had... <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a polite way of saying that. Yeah. Yes. But, yeah but, that, I mean, that is... you, it's a fair question. Um, I mean, uh, off the top of my head, I mean, we, there's been a few here and there. Um, uh, we did, we did. I mean, generally speaking, the ones, the live records that we've done have been ones that have been unusual events. I guess is the way that mm. I would try and justify it. Um, the so we did live from Union Chapel, which is this one-off show that we never did before or since, and it just seemed like a moment to capture, and it came out pretty well, so we put that out. Um, we did show two thousand, which. Obviously, you know, it's a self-created milestone, but it, nevertheless, it felt like a milestone. And as it happened, the audience that night is an audience that I would like to fucking keep in a box and take with me everywhere I go, because God damn it. Like they sung along with the mandolin riff at the start of Losing Days, which no one does. And it was just like, I remember all of us on stage immediately when the because generally speaking we're on in-ear monitors you know we have a little bit of live sound kind of mixed into our ears the show started and we all turned to join our monitor engineer and was like audience mics down jesus christ they're the loudest crowd in the fucking universe um and it was just an absolutely just there were nights when 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 the chips fall in the right places you know what i mean yeah i listened to your live in newcastle show today hmm. um and what i really liked about it was that it, it seemed like a way for you to talk about your career and your songwriting in sort of almost a one-off show in that there's lots of stories between the songs yeah. and there's lots of, this is the motivation for this song. This is where yeah, I was in my yeah. life. And it felt like a autobiographical way of doing a live show like that. Yeah, definitely. Well, so that was, that's the other one is, and the reason 
we we recorded the whole tour actually because the thing is we we did i think we did five weeks in the states and two weeks in the uk and that's all we ever did of that format we were sat down the audience was sat down it's not a thing i've ever done before and i'm not saying i'll never do it again but it's like it's not on my to-do list anytime soon um so I wanted to capture it because that's the thing. Like if somebody, if I play a quote unquote regular show and somebody misses it, it's like, well then just come to the next one, which doesn't apply in that instance, because as I say, it's the thing we were planning on doing once and did once. Um, and also like the presentationally, like um, if I may be allowed to have a controversial opinion briefly, um, of course. the Springsteen live on Broadway thing did nothing for me. And I'm a huge Springsteen fan and it just seemed tired to me. Um, and like, if you've read his book and, and, and ever seen him live before, it was all retrod ground and it just seemed a bit kind of, there was nothing new and, and I love Springsteen pieces, but it did, that didn't do very much for me. By contrast, the Loudon Wainwright special that's on Netflix, which if you haven't seen it, let's stop this interview now and you go and watch it. It's, um, is, is stunning because it's got, it, it's so revelatory and it's so raw and, and, but it's also funny and. And I remember when we were planning that show, obviously it wasn't a Netflix special because that's not who I am, but <laughs> unfortunately, but, um, uh, um, you know, it had a kind of, I remember thinking to myself, well, that's going to be the model for this rather than the Broadway thing. Um, and obviously it was a bit more of a show than a talking thing. Although I do talk a fuck of a lot on that record, let's be honest with each other. But, um, uh, you know, it, it wanted to have that kind of narrative arc to it, you know, and, as I say, we re we did record the whole tour, but I'm glad we picked one from the end of the tour because by that point, more so than usual tours for me, it, the set list was set, and indeed the the patter was set because not not identical every night, but there was just there were points I was trying to hit in between each song and stories to tell and all the rest of it, and and by that point it had become quite well oiled, and it's theatrical to a degree, but um, it also it achieved what I was trying to do. So you, you you said at the beginning about the energy exchange in a live show. Mm. And I think, you know, anyone that's seen you live, and I'm going to presume a lot of people who are listening to this have seen you live, know that that's something that clearly you take very seriously and it's something you're very good at as well in that holding mm -hmm. that room. What other performers do you look at and think, oh, that's something I'd like to be able to do? Or like you hold them in a high regard for being able to do that? Uh, well, I mean, to answer the first part of that question, everyone is the short answer. And I actually think that anybody, I think this is true of loads of people. Many people may not admit it, but if you're somebody who's remotely interested in or any good at playing live, you are a note taker. You go and see any fucking band, including a bar band at your local pub or whatever. There is a part of your brain that is taking notes and you're observing how they pulled that off and, oh, that was interesting. Oh, that didn't work. Or that did work or whatever. You know, it's just a way that your mind works. And I mean, you know, for me, I remember the first kind of proper, like big, not kind of DIY underground tour I did was opening for Pitch Shifter in 2003 with Million Dead. And um, I remember like watching JS on the very first night and just going, oh, okay, that's how you do being a front man because he just walked on like you, you, like he walked on like, you know, he was doing you a favor by letting you be in the room, not in a shitty way. It was just like, oh yeah, cool. Thanks for coming kind of thing. But in a, and it just the room was his instantly. And he's and one of the specifically, I remember like he sung at the crowd. And at that point in time, because we were used to playing like squats and stuff, I used to sing at my shoes, at the kick drum, at the ceiling, maybe at the guitar player if I was feeling brave, but I wasn't gonna fucking look at the audience. And um, you know, he was straight out there, like bah! in the front row. And it was like, okay, yeah, that's really good. But you know, and we've been fortunate to tour with um Dropkick Murphy's amazing live band, Fogging Molly. Um not just headlines as well. I mean, one of my favorite, favorite tours I've ever done was when we had a band called Larry and His Flask open for us. Actually, we did two tours. We did the um, uh, USA and UK and Europe with them because they were so good. The, I, I had their records. I liked their records. I thought they were great. I asked them to be on the tour. The first night of the tour was in Boston, and I watched their set, as I always do, and and uh, um, I went backstage and during Tangover and said to the guys in my band, like, we have a fucking problem because I've just <laughs> seen the best live band I've ever seen in my fucking life. And they ended the show with the drummer stage diving into his drum kit, which was in the crowd. And like, <laughs> fuck, um, you know, and like, it was just kind of, um, I like that on a tour of having a band before us who, um, who gives us a run for our money, you know? It's a cool feeling. But yeah, so you're, you're always kind of taking notes. I mean, in terms of like people like, I spend a lot of time. I spend a lot of time thinking about Springsteen. I think he's a great performer, and what I particularly like about Springsteen is that 
he's not somebody who's hugely reliant on kind of um, light shows and stuff like that. I don't have a problem with light shows, and for some bands, it's totally what you want. Like Radiohead's light show is always phenomenal, um, but like I just it just doesn't quite feel like it's me. And like Springsteen somehow manages to be a bar band at a stadium show, and I fucking love that. Do you know what I mean? And like yeah. it's just cool as shit. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Nick Cave is a huge in, in, inspiration for me. Um, in every conceivable way, really. Um, <laughs> not least his performance. Um, you know, he's an incredibly engaging, dare, dare I say it, sexual performer. There's something really kind of like, kind of uh, weirdly erotic about the way he, he plays live. But yeah, generally speaking, like any fucking band that can tear it up, it's like, I'll be taking note. At what age then did you decide, or what point in your life did you decide that you wanted to be a performer and this is what it is that you wanted to do? <laughs> Um, well, I think the thing is, like, it's interesting to use the word performer there because it, there are different stages of realization for me. From when I got into Maiden, I wanted to be in a band. Um, and as far as I was concerned, when I was 11 years old, that probably meant I had VHSs of, like, you know, ACDC Live in Moscow. And it was like, cool, I'll just do that. <laughs> as if as if that was just a thing you decide to do. <laughs> and wonder, yeah. Um, you know, and, and playing to, like, 200,000 people or whatever the fuck it is. Um, uh, you know, and then... Then, like, a big moment for me was discovering the book Get in the Van by Henry Rollins. I got into Black Flag, and then I got that book, which was kind of like a Bible for me for a long time. Um, and I read it cover to cover many times. Uh, and then, you know, also there were uh, colliery books to that, stuff like Our Band Could Be a Life by Michael Azarad, which was a huge book for me, um, and stuff like that. So, you know, reading about underground touring. I guess at that point it was still kind of... Um, academic to a degree in the sense that i was not aware of an underground scene existing in you know and then i came across the hardcore scene in the in the kind of mid to late 90s the, the ukhc scene household name records um and there was kind of a circuit you could do that was like london leeds peterborough weirdly enough norwich um cardiff was pretty good southampton um and uh glasgow and so I did my first tour in 98, um, which we booked ourselves no one gave a shit or came but it was lots of fun um and you know, so I was then, you know, that for a time I was in that kind of early against me record kind of view of like, I'm just going to tour squats for the rest of my life or whatever. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, and then over time that kind of, uh, when when I joined Million Dead, the, the interesting thing about the drum for Million Dead had been in Knee Joke, my previous band, so we were on the same page. But the bass player, Julia, she her day job was she worked for a record label and she knew what a booking agent did and what a manager did and like what things like this and and indeed could get us gigs like opening for the icarus line and it was like fuck like in a venue with people in it. um and so that kind of broadened my horizon shall we say um and you know it's early on i figured out something i loved and that i wanted to do a lot um but i guess one of my kind of rev my revelatory moments for me and i can't tell you exactly when this was but it's certainly during my solo career is that what I'm trying to do for a job involves three separate disciplines. There's songwriting, there's musicianship, and there's performance. And I think a lot of people recognize the first two as being separate entities, but a lot of people, particularly from a punk scene, kind of almost kind of like philosophically refuse to accept that performance is a, is also an art form. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. like the act of engaging a crowd and putting on a good show, because you can be one or two of those three good one or two of those three things and not the other you can be a great songwriter and a great performer and a terrible musician or, or a great performer and a great musician and a terrible songwriter or whatever you know um but yeah just sort of triangulating that that was also a thing that you could concentrate on on itself do you know what i mean and to be like okay how do i make it that when people come to my shows they have a good fucking time and they enjoy themselves and they're engaged with the show and if they're far away from the stage they don't feel left out of it and all this kind of thing um I couldn't tell you exactly when that was. I guess it was when I started playing slightly bigger rooms. Um, but uh, yeah, it was definitely kind of, that was a, that was an aha moment for me of going, oh fuck, right, okay. I think we've got time to do one more category. So we can go for, I'll, get, I'll leave it up to you, it's your choice. We can either go for favorite album of all time, excluding <laughs> okay. everything we've already spoken about, or we can go for album that had the biggest influence on you, either personally as a songwriter or a performer or... <sighs> Um, well, I'm going to go for the second one simply because I think favorite album of all time is a nebulous category and I reserve the right <laughs> things my mind halfway through answering the fucking question. Um, uh, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, it really depends what day of the week you ask me on that kind of thing. I mean, biggest al biggest impact, again, that's quite hard because records have different impacts to different 
points in time. You could make the argument that it was Killers in the sense that it turned me on to rock music conceptually. Um, and that's enormous. Um, in Utero was huge for me. Um, August and Everything After by Cat and Crows is a contender for my answer to this question, actually. Um, in fact, yeah, I'm going to get two briefly. So August and Everything After, I got into metal, I got into punk, all the things that we've talked about. The brief sidebar going on in my life is that my older sister was into stuff like Weezer, Cat and Crows, and Soul Asylum. And I sort of, not music that I took enormously seriously at the time because nobody had spiky hair, but at the same time, like, um, I had an acoustic guitar or possibly my sister had an acoustic guitar and i learned how to play cat and crow songs because i could play those ones when i couldn't play megadeth and i can tell you from experience that megadeth doesn't achieve anything at a beach party either um <laughs> so <laughs> you know hang on 18 no one gives a fuck um but so i kind of learned to play all the songs of Hogwarts and everything after before becoming a fan and then sort of became a fan in the process um and over time I often sit down and realize quite how much the DNA of that record kind of still courses through my veins. Um, you know, it's, it's still important in my thinking about music. I mean, to be more specific and possibly a little bit highfalutin, um, <laughs> the, uh, um, when I was learning those songs, those Cat and Crow songs, I was learning for a very specific purpose, which was to lead a sing-along at a kind of party or beach holiday or whatever it wasn't a case of performing it wasn't like everyone shut up and listen to me it was like i know the chords and we all know the words and that way we can i can by learning these chords i have facilitated a collective experience and i think that there is still an element of that in what i do i mean obviously i write the songs that i play at my shows these days but nevertheless my favorite moment as a show is when it becomes that what me and the band are doing on stage is facilitating the mass collective event of singing rather than wanting people to shut the fuck up. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, and it yeah. becomes the fourth wall breaks down, however you want to put it, like it becomes a collective endeavor. And, and I think that that comes from being a Cat and Crows fan when I was a kid. So that's definitely, that probably is the answer, but as a sidebar bonus answer, um, I had a moment in about 2010 when I, I'd done a record called Poetry of the Deed that I wasn't super satisfied with afterwards. It had a couple of songs I loved and it felt like I was treading water on some of the other stuff. And I was just feeling a bit directionless. And it was my third record and it's like, fuck, have I run out of ideas? I've done three records and that was it. Um, and then I heard an album by a band called Me Without You. And the record is called It's All Crazy, It's All False, It's All a Dream, It's All Right. And um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Um, no, I don't know it, no. Yeah, it is it is the most... I mean, they're, they're actually usually a kind of post-hardcore band, very good post-hardcore band, but they did this one kind of holiday record in their career, which is a kind of... It's a sort of mystical folk album. Um, the band is Three Brothers and another guy, and the Three Brothers are... I, they're sort of Kabbalists, I want to say. They're, they're, it's a, some kind of like sort of subdivision of Judaism. It's very specific. Um, I did used to know what that was specifically, and I now feel like a terrible person for not remembering precisely. Essentially, it's a kind of religious animal folklore record that's a folk album, but it's the most linguistically um, adventurous and brilliant record I'd ever heard at the time, and possibly still, you know, and it's just, um, you know, you got used to kind of, yeah, yeah, baby, I'm in a car kind of rock and roll lyrics, and then you know, he says, through mostly vacant streets, a baker from the outskirts of his town earned his living peddling sweets from a ragged cart that he pushed around. And you're just like, you know, the baker shouted threats like castanets to curse the crafty bird. And it's like, it's fucking poetry and it's absolutely stunning. And, and indeed, musically, it was so cool because it was really, really simple, but it wasn't simple. But it was like, you listen to, and it just sort of felt obvious, but it wasn't obvious. And it just, that it just really, really re-injected my songwriting career. And most of England Keep My Bones was inspired by that. And to a large degree, a lot of what I've done since has been inspired by that record. So. I was I, just really quickly on that point then, like mm. they're, they're, both of those albums then, uh, um, I know the Counts and Crows album, uh, lyrically it reads very poetically. Mm. Do you think there's a distinction between lyrics and poems and poetry? Yes. 100,000% yes, as evinced by somebody publishing a book of Ian Brown's lyrics as poetry. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to do the man down, but like, come on. Um, lyrics, and, and I, I'd say that about myself as well. My, my lyrics don't stand up as poetry. They shouldn't be published as poetry. That's not what they're for. They exist in a musical context and they entirely contextually depend on the sound around them. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, an, that's a 
different thing to poetry, which is a much raw and more naked art form. They're obviously related. Um, but personally, I think the number of people whose lyrics survive as poems is vanishingly rare. And in fact, in my experience, most of the people who I personally would put in that category from my own experience are people who, as far as I can tell, write the lyrics separately as poetry anyway, whether you're talking about Nick Cave or Landon Cohen or John K. Sampson, um, or those kinds of people, you know. Um, so I'm not, I'm not kind of um, throwing shade on lyrics that don't survive as poetry. As I say, I'm not sure that mine do, but it's, yeah, they're, they're different things, you know, and, and I think that um, it, it just does, everybody would be better off if we just all accepted that <laughs> and, uh, and, and dealt with it. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you for coming on, Frank. Uh, where can people find you? What have you got coming up? Anything you want to plug? Um, um yeah, I mean, I'm on the internet. Um, <laughs> I'm reasonably easy to find on the internet. Um, uh, I've got to be slightly oblique about this. I mean, I've just finished this independent of any love shows thing that I was doing. Um, I've got a new, there's new stuff coming any second now. That's all I'm allowed to say. <laughs> that was rubbish. That's wasn't enough. It? Um, there's, there's that's There's enough for me to sell it to the enemy. That's fine. That's... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's it. Welcome back. That was my chat with Frank. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly had a lot of fun recording it. So there's loads of stuff I didn't get to ask Frank about, unfortunately, um, but hopefully we'll get him back on in the future at some point so I can get into a few of those topics as well as getting some more albums out of him that we should all go and listen to. Um, so like I said at the start, I've been into Frank for a real long time. I've been following his career since about the time that he started doing solo stuff, actually. So it's absolutely insane see, watching him go from those early shows of sort of 20, 30 people in the back of a pub to playing arenas now. <laughs> absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I'm a fan of his stuff. I think he absolutely deserves to be where he is. Um, and I can't wait for th this plague to go away so that I can go and see him again. Uh, if you enjoyed the chat, you can have a look on your podcast app and you'll see loads more episodes from me, uh, including ones with Beans on Toast, AJJ and Days and Days most recently as well. They're all well worth your time checking out. Um, if you don't know those bands, go and listen to them. If you do, listen to their recommendations because they're very, very good as well. Um, that's in the show, really. Uh, if you enjoyed it, give us a like, give us a follow, give us a subscribe. You can also share it with your friends on social media as well. That would make me very, very happy. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at vinyl underscore underscore tap. Um, you can find me on Twitter at It's Record Time and on Facebook by searching It's Record Time Podcast. You can also send me an email if you want um, at... Ooh, my email address is it's record time podcast at gmail.com if you want to say hi or if you just want to ask me any questions or you know, just send me anything really i don't mind um for anyone who's been listening the last few weeks as well i can confirm that i am doing this edit on a thursday again uh, i have again failed to not do this at the last minute but i did actually start some of this on wednesday this time so i'm getting slightly better at managing my time you never know one day i might not be finished at 10 at night um, anyway, until next week, uh, have a good one. Bye.